Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to talk about the difference between tabletop, competition, and display quality. And what is exactly does that mean for your work? So let's get into it. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of different miniatures I've painted and how I would frame them as tabletop versus display versus competition and what exactly I see as the defining characteristics of that. Before we go and look at the individual miniatures, I think it's important to lay just a little bit of quick groundwork. And the first thing I'll say is that there's no one definition of anything we're about to discuss. The reality is, is that all of these things comprise a broad spectrum of techniques, application, quality, purpose, like why are you painting the miniature, to what end, and of course skill. So that is to say, <clears throat> what one person's display quality might be, might be actually quite different than another's, okay? But I think there is still an important value to thinking in these terms, not in this sort of 17th century enlightenment false categorization way it seems to be used, but instead in thinking about how you approach your figures and decide about the amount of effort, time, and sort of intensity you're going to put into them and hoping you to focus on sort of what actually matters when painting your miniatures, depending on what your ultimate goal is. So with that being said, let's jump over to, to a different screen. Okay, so here uh, I have a unit of Empire handgunners that I painted quite a long time ago as part of the video where I speed painted an army in a week. Oh, a week. Oh, how where was I ever that young? Just a week? How lazy of me. I could have done far better. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, this is definitely what I would frame as tabletop quality. And if you go back and look at how I execute in the video, you'll see that I'm doing a lot of things here like using thin inks over zenithal to get a lot of my contrast. Maybe I'm reinforcing it just slightly to pop up a little bit uh, of additional highlights. Uh, I'm doing things like getting the skin tone through the cheating of stuff like washes. Now I'd probably use uh, contrast paints, but those didn't exist at the time. And so I think when you when you look at the elements like this, when you when you look at a, a you know a group of minis like this, when you're thinking about tabletop standard, what that effectively means is one, speed is sort of your overarching concern, or if not that, there is at least a time box. I think that's the first defining feature of what it means to be painting in a tabletop standard. So we all want to paint our figures well, I think that seems fair, and we all want to spend as little time as is necessary because life is short and we all have a lot of things to do. We have spouses and partners and children and jobs and sleep, I guess, for some people. There are other things, other demands on your time. So ideally you want to be finding some kind of balance between these two components, quality and time. But in the end, one of them has to win. One of them has to be the deciding factor. And if time is to be the deciding factor, then almost by necessity, you are gonna end up in tabletop unless you set a really, really high bar like Okay, I won't spend more than 100 hours per Empire Handgunner. Okay, fine, you can still paint to whatever quality level you want, just because the sculpt isn't going to demand that level of, of attention in almost any scenario, even for a competition, that, that would be excessive for a single one of these guys. 50, 60 hours? Probably not. Uh, that's probably about where you would be for uh, a single figure that's part of a unit in a competition entry. But my point is, is that that's not usually what we mean when we say we're painting in a limited amount of time. What we usually mean is time is the key factor. And if that's the case, then we're going to figure out where we uh, can minimize quality. 
And the answer is in a big unit of guys like this, and I did 30 of them, you know, having some basic contrast, having some basic simple muted colors works just fine. The individual elements are all picked out. Everything's there, right? So everything is there. Everything has some kind of contrast. Even the metals have some kind of darker ink supplied and stuff like that to give them more reflection and things of that nature. So everything has some kind of shading and highlight. Colors are relatively simple. Yes, they look fairly desaturated because they're, you know, thin inks over a zenithal, which will always give that look, but it works. And that's the key. Let's look at another image here. This is one I did more recently. This was for the Seraphon video for 24 hour, the, the Seraphon 24 hour painting challenge. And this is absolutely a tabletop quality job, okay? Uh, what techniques was I using here? Well, I certainly relied heavily on things like the airbrush to do a lot of work. I use things like dry brushing and washing extensively because it's a good way to get through a lot of stuff fast. And by the way, there's this is a judgment-free zone, this video, okay? There's no wrong way to paint a miniature. A painted miniature is better than an unpainted miniature, full stop. All right, but those techniques tend to be a little less precise, which makes them in general, not as acceptable for broad usage in things like display or competition uh, painting, where quality becomes the ultimate deciding factor. But in addition, look closely at this guy and spot all of the different errors, right? So I'll, I'll draw your attention. Notice how this area here isn't actually orange because I missed this spot and that, not gonna take that amount of time to clean that up, right? Okay, notice how all the wood is so basically monotone because it's just a couple of washes over dry brushed wood. It's, you know, the scale 75 ink tense wood and then a couple of layers of Agrax or something like that over the top, then maybe a dry brush, then a hair from sepia. Super fast, super easy to apply. I could do it in a minute or two, set it to the side, and go back to working on the skinks, right? The only guy here who has any kind of extra effort expended on him is the skinker do in the middle, the chief, who did get a little more time, and that's because he's the center point of where you're actually looking. Like, when you click to this, this image, or when you're looking at this mini on the table, what you're seeing first is this little guy hanging out right up top because he's bold, he's brighter than anything beneath him. He's actually aided by all these horns and everything that are kind of drawing your attention up here to him. Not to mention the fact he has the bright weapon that's reflecting light and he has his little bright crest, right? So because I knew that guy was the center of attention, I put more effort into him and ignored it everywhere else. And that leads me to the sort of element of tabletop quality that's the most important. Tabletop quality means spending time where it matters and ignoring everything else. Like you go as basic as you can with everything else to get it done. So the classic way I always heard it said was, uh, you know, faces, bases, banners, and shields. We can take that a little broader and say things like faces, the bases, which I certainly spent a good amount of time on the bases here. And I think the jungle bases, I have a whole video on that. Uh, I think they really help these minis pop. Um, but I think that's a big deal. You notice that I spent a lot of time on the face of the little skinker do. So he looks real, you know, he, his face grabs you. I knew you were going to be staring at it. Hence, I actually spent some time there making things look nice and clean. Things like weapons, exposed weapons, shields, stuff like that. Things that people are holding, we will tend to look at. So... Humans are very trained to look at two areas when we meet other people. Their face, their eyes, and whatever they have in their hands. For obvious reasons. Because those are the two ways we know whether this is going to be a fight or flight situation, right? Very early in our evolutionary development, we had to make decisions. And the quickest way to make a decision is, does this, does this being I'm encountering, what is his face, what is his or her face telling me? Are they angry? Are they sad? Are they in need of help? Are they in pain? Do they have a weapon with which they mean to do me harm, right? So we make very fast flash judgments looking at those kind of areas. 
when it comes to miniatures, it seems like it'd be removed, but it doesn't. We tend to still employ the same heuristics. So focusing on things like the weapons, which you can see there, I tried to do a nice metallic, uh, like a nice metallic blend over the weapon to make it look really interesting and varied. Okay. Uh, I focused on his face, the stuff that matters. But look at the underbelly of the Stegodon. Like there's all this interesting texture, all these different little sort of bumps and things that he has going on, which I've just done nothing with. Nothing. And that's fine. Because ultimately it doesn't matter. This was a speed painting project. This was aiming at tabletop quality. That stuff can be ignored. I made the little bones look rather, you know, look as nice as I could with some quick stratification lines to make them kind of stand out. Backed it up with a little bit of dry brushing to purposely get a little bit of rough texture in there to break up some color. And called it a day. Right? Because we didn't need to go farther than that. These are some old Storm Fiends that I did. Uh, so same thing here, you're going to see an effect, right? Now, <clears throat> their armor is very simple. That's a, some quick airbrush blending on the big armor pieces. Really nothing too complicated. Uh, their skin is much the same. Their uh, little robe and tabard pieces, much the same. All these effects were real simple, mostly done with an airbrush or very quickly with a brush using you know thin colors over zenithal to achieve what I needed to achieve. Right? But notice for the two guys with the rattling cannons, I went to the extra effort to do the heated gun barrel effect, right? And the reason that I did that heated gun barrel effect is because I knew that would be drawing attention. Again, big weapons, they're pointing out there, they're like very in your face with them. So that was worth putting that extra time into. Tabletop isn't necessarily about some objective measure of quality. What I am able to paint in two hours or five hours or 10 hours will be better than someone else and not as good as yet a third person, okay? What's ultimately important is that we use the 10 hours that we have or five hours or two hours or 30 minutes to accomplish the most we can where it matters, where we know attention is going to be drawn and where we know we can have a good visual impact and make the fig interesting. So things like making sure that the little runes were well picked out on the armor was something I spent time on because those are, you know, I've seen people paint this armor and leave things like the runes just the same color, which is boring. Like it's such a nice chance to pop out a supplementary color and make a little bit of visual interest in an otherwise big flat space that's all the same. Right? But between the guns and just extra little things like that, we were able to create something fairly visually interesting, but still be fast. These are the ogres that I did for uh, the uh, for a 24-hour speed paint video. Yet again, here is much the same thing in practice. Right? There, the skin was all airbrush. You can go watch the video, see how I did all that. Absolutely nothing special about it. Uh, it was just sort of building up some colors with an airbrush. I, could, I did the whole army, all their skin, in maybe, I think, off the top of my head, two and a half, three hours. I mean, it's it's so fast to achieve something like this. And that's why something like an airbrush can be a great, 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 great tool for achieving tabletop quality fast. All right? Same with pants, by the way. But the extra elements that I added to try to make it more visually interesting are stuff like the banner. Obviously, I freehanded the banner. Again, bases, faces, banners, shields, weapons, that kind of thing. So I added the painted banner because I thought, well, it's a pretty major defining element of this unit. And so I want it to be something that looks kind of cool, right? So I just Googled around real quick for an image idea that I thought looked kind of neat and basically just drew a simple version of that. No big deal. Didn't worry too much about refinement. Didn't worry too much about cleanliness just worried about getting it down and having it look visually interesting. Same with the weathering and the rusting. This is another thing that can be used in lieu of sort of extreme blends or things like that on tabletop quality stuff to make it look more interesting quickly. Things like weathering, rusting, and those sorts of tricks create a lot of visual interest when used sparingly. I'm gonna say that again for the people on the back, sparingly 
Uh, if they are overused, it just becomes, it'll just look like a cacophonous mess. But when you have a little bit here and there, as you can see, of like some orange and brown and scattered around and little bits of rust hiding here and there on the weapons and things, it actually becomes something that's, again, visually compelling. A cool thing, part of the larger whole. Okay. This guy was for my uh, Zinch army. And again, that army was done basically to, to tabletop standard. And here I knew what I wanted was for things like the skin to be really eye-catching. <clears throat> so by choosing to go with the color pink, which is this very bright, loud, eye-catching color, and then contrasting it with the blues and, and teals of, of, uh, of Zinj, right? It gave this guy a lot more visual interest. If his skin had been blue, which you see a lot of Zangor painted blue, he would be a much less compelling figure. It'd be just that easy, which seems so silly. But color choice is one of those things that can make a big deal in tabletop armies. Now, sometimes our color choice is restricted, right? Uh, if you're painting Ultramarines or uh, Blood Angels or something, you know, those are to have specific color schemes. Although sometimes you do still have the ability to mix it up in there and, and things like that. So if color choice is one of the things that's on the menu for you, then the use of brighter, more vibrant colors can often be a substitute for a lot of extra time spent in sort of display painting when you just want to have an army look eye-catching, look compelling, and look visually interesting, right? But you can get there fast. <coughs> so having things like your army be using strong complementary colors, like using bright blues and orange, okay? Uh, or having your army feature a lot of like really pastel colors, like bright pinks and purples and teals. These are things you'll see I use a lot. I like them because I like visually bright, compelling armies that just grab your eye from a long distance away. You probably won't see me paint an army that's just a bunch of browns, right? So just adding little elements like your color choice and your composition stage, just be fast, you can still end up with a better result. And all this is still in tabletop quality. All right, so now we're gonna transition out of tabletop. And I wanna talk about what exactly makes that transition happen. So when it came to my iron jaws, part of the goal was to make sure that I had a display quality army. So, and that's what I aim for with most of my armies these days. Uh, I have enough armies. I mean, I have something like 16 armies painted. So the idea of having a rush job as an army just really doesn't make sense to me. So what's the difference between tabletop and display quality? When you go into display quality, what you're aiming for is something that has more nuance and more detail. So when I move in closer, I can see a lot more elements that are only discovered at that level, okay? There's a level of refinement and a level of detail to me that makes display painting. It means you're aiming for smoother blends, additional detail, you're using things like texture, right? All of those sorts of elements. You're also aiming to have much more complementary hues and, and uh, contrast of both hue and value showing up in the piece. So, for example, on my Iron Jaws armor, every one of them features, every single part of my Iron Jaws army has lots of freehand, all their armor. So, in addition to doing these big blends, and again, you can go back and watch the video on how I do Iron Jaws armor, but in addition to having these big blends that go basically from white to very dark blue black. I also have these freehand flames all over the armor. I also have this freehand damage all over the armor, right? All of this is painted on, right? Like none of this damage is real. So that meant I had to do lots of steps. So blend out and smooth out the armor, which took 
quite a while. And then I would have to go back in and do all the freehand. Then I would have to go back in and add the battle damage around and all the steps there, right? Very carefully applying all these different layers and then streak over the top and stuff like that. Same thing for the metallics where I'm making sure, which again, I have, I have videos on everything for the Iron Jaw, so you can go back in the Hobby Cheating playlist and find all that stuff. But making sure that there was good transition, very natural in all the metals, that there was interesting sort of rust, verdigree happening in places, all these sorts of things, right? That in things like the orc skin, I made sure that there was life through having pink. And you can see it in the nose and the lips, in his ears, it's in their knuckles, right? Little bits of that different hue varied in. And you wouldn't notice that looking at these guys from a distance on the tabletop. But you notice it when you get super close. Um, when you get super close, you'd see things like the little veins have a slight shading to them. So each, each vein was individually picked out you'd notice like all their leather belts. I've actually hashed out texture and stuff on all the belts and all the pants. So they all have little scuff marks and, and things like that. All those little tiny touches, right? Okay, that's to me where you're making the jump into display quality. This is another example. This is from my Daughters of Cain, which is also painted to be a display army. Um, as a point of fact, this was originally painted to be a display army, but then I ended up taking it to competition and they did quite well, but that's where the line between those two is kind of blurry. We'll talk about it in a moment. Um, but again, here, so yet again, we're using like, still we can use a lot of the tricks we learned before. Bright colors that are interesting and complementary. So here I'm using the pink and the teal. This is, I think, one of the first armies where people started to be like, Vince, you only use pink and teal. That's not true. I use pink and then everything in the teal to turquoise range and purple. Thank you very much. No. So, um, but this was this was a really fun army to do. So again, really trying to make sure, unlike last time when we looked at the Empire guys, here we're really trying to sketch out the individual elements of these girls, right? Like their faces are well defined, the shadows are carved out all over the place. Every volume has been identified, right? Okay. The weapons have a lot of extra work put into them to make them have this sort of glow type effect. Right? The hair and the individual stranding, the veins on the wings, all these sorts of things. When you're talking about display quality, in, in my mind it goes like this. Here's where we start. Okay. Here's where we start. Tabletop takes you to there. Display takes you to there. Competition takes you to there. And all three of those steps take an equal amount of time. Almost. Okay? So, what I mean by that is you don't see the huge change that you do between display quality and tabletop that you see between... Uh, or sorry, you don't see the same, you don't. You see a big change between tabletop and display quality that you don't see between display and competition. Okay. But I will talk about what that difference amounts to. The real focus shift here is that I stopped having time as my determinant factor, right? All of these minis for the Iron Jaws army and my daughters, and, you know, the elements of this army, and this is a good bridge into competition minis. I said, well, I'm gonna paint them until I don't wanna paint them anymore. And I'm gonna try to take them as far as I can. And what that meant was that quality was my ultimate decider. If I put 40 hours in and I was happy and I felt like I got somewhere, then I was good. If it took another 40 hours, then that's what we're doing, right? And this brings me to where, to Marathi, to Miss Centerpiece model of this particular army. I think where you should try to push yourself into display quality first, if you find yourself as a tabletop painter and you want to say, well, I would like to push my painting quality, then where you want to start trying that in an army, you're still an army painter, 
I'm still an army painter. I love painting armies. It's fun as all get out. I paint pieces just for competition as well, but painting armies is super fun, okay? So, if you're like me, if you're someone who is at heart an army painter and loves playing games with your plastic toys, which there's nothing wrong with, but you also want to be able to paint some display quality stuff here and there, this is the place to start, not Marathi specifically, but your centerpiece model, your leaders, your space marine captains, your whatever it is, right? It doesn't have to be a big model like this. Not all, not your, your characters and your centerpieces. It could be as simple as your Lord Celestine on foot, or it could be as complicated as your Lord Celestine on Star Drake, right? Say you were about to collect the new Lumineth Realm Lords. Look at that box set that came out, right? If I had that box set in front of me, the character I would be spending the most time on was that Light of Eltharion. Because it's a super cool fig, it's not that big, but it's going to stand out in the army. That's where you push yourself into that display quality. And for Marathi, it was it started actually with my goal that I would do a display piece, but by the end I had started liking it so much, I then kept pushing her <coughs> into a competition piece. Okay? And so what I found was that I just wanted to keep painting her. I just wanted to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. And as a point of fact, this is where expectations matter. At the start of your project, I think it's important to understand what is your constraint and where do you intend to stop? This is the best way to avoid being unsatisfied with your work. If your goal is tabletop, then you have said time is more important than quality. In the balance, it doesn't mean quality is zero. I think when I say that, sometimes people think it's a light switch. It's not a light switch. It could be 51% time and 49% quality, but time still wins, right? So... But once you've already decided on quality, then it's just a question of how far you want to go. Right? So what does that mean? So when we get to things like competition managers, I, th I hear a lot of people, and I think a lot of people sometimes believe that things like basing or something has got to be a big part of it. Like you've got to have a big crazy base. This guy has a decent enough base. It's not super crazy. Bases are fine. Uh, I see pieces win competitions all the time that have extremely simplistic bases. You don't need a big, crazy base. And in fact, it can often take away from your competition piece. If your base is not at the same level as the rest of your piece, all you did was paint yourself into a hole. Because now you just, you've got a big anchor literally attached to the feet of your miniature, trying to slow you down. Uh, but this guy was certainly for competition. This was the, the fig I did for how to paint Imperial Fist uh, yellow. And I really like how this guy came out with the, the sort of lighting structure and stuff like that around him. He has a very warm side and a very cold side, which is kind of the goal I was going for. I wanted him to look like he was sort of standing somewhere at, at dawn. And, uh, you know, sort of have, after having defeated his, uh, his foes, but what competition ultimately means, especially as you push yourself higher and higher in competition pieces, is spending lots and lots and lots and lots of time refining. Spotting from a foot away the difference between a good display piece and a good competition piece is usually impossible. That's why if you've ever been to like a Golden Demon or a miniature painting competition and you look in the case, you might find 7 or 20 or 50 pieces you think are all totally awesome. And then the judges don't pick them and you're like, why? I don't get it. Those are totally awesome. Well, because you were looking at the thing from here. Okay? And the judges were looking at the thing from here. And you notice a lot more at that level. Right? Obviously, even this guy on screen right now. I've blown him up real big, and in doing so, I notice things I want to go fix. So, there you go. Uh, but competition is always, as you, as you transition from display to competition, 
The difference there means spending twice as much time as you have already, more or less. Simply doing final, careful refinements that if you do them right, almost nobody will notice. It is making sure that every sharp edge or little thin line you've drawn, whether freehand or an edge highlight or anything like that, is completely crisp. Meaning not only did you draw right there, but you went back with the other color and blocked it out. So it is a perfectly crisp line. It means making sure that every shadow and every transition is perfectly smooth. And every bit of texture is where you want it. And every highlight goes to exactly how high it should go. Right? And on and on and on and on and on. Slightly adjusting the color. Like the number of times I adjusted the light on this guy's face, because I wasn't exactly happy with how bright this side would seem versus this side, so many times. Because I had to keep going back and forth and looking at him, then setting him down, then looking at him up close. And I mean, I probably spent 20 hours just fixing highlights on his face. And if I hadn't made those changes, it wouldn't be that much, it wouldn't look that much different to you, especially not on camera right now. But it would look very different to somebody judging it in a competition. Take something like the this Keeper of Secrets, right? So this Keeper of Secrets, again, is actually at a display quality. And I didn't take her all the way to competition, but she has a lot of elements of those things that one would you know expect to see. So she has a lot of freehand and stuff like that. Obviously, all these different color shifts and fades. I mean, she's freehand all over the place. All of her blends I tried to keep, you know, perfectly creamy smooth. She has things like texture. I think her hair came out really well. Non-metallic metal as true metallic metal type effects. All that stuff works, right? But if she were going to go to competition, she would still need to go even farther, right? I would need to go around and spend a lot more time changing almost nothing. Doing things like making sure the corner of her eye here had a little bit more of like a pink tone to it where it fades out to, you know, the, the sort of corner of your eye ducks. Doing things like making sure this line under her, where her corset is coming up, is nice and clean and not so kind of messy as it is right now. Right? Doing things like making sure these little individual scales that start up here are nice and picked out on the edges so that they stand out more from the, the darkness that they're about to go into under this claw guard. All those little tiny touches like that, making sure that everything is reinforced, lined, sharp, and ultimately extremely clean is what defines a competition mini over a display quality mini. I wanted to end here on this guy. Uh, this is Ignis. He is one of my, one of my knights uh, that I did for my whole knight army. And so if you followed the channel for a while, you know I did several of these. Uh, I love painting knights. I think they're one of the most fun miniatures to paint. Uh, I'll be working on their chaos opposition uh, now over the next couple years. I've got one done. And uh, there'll be more coming. But Ignis, who was also featured in a hobby cheating video on doing detailed freehand, is a good example of bringing everything together into a, a competition figure. Like, this is everything. I made a conscious decision before I started this project to hold nothing back. Nothing. Right? To make sure that I left nothing on the table. So, whether it's the sort of extreme use of shadows and stuff like that in the metals and making sure that they really all, all the metals we're reading is visually interesting. The hyper detailed freehand that I went back through and cleaned up and tried to make sure it was very, very, very sharp and effective in what it was doing and where it was being used. Whether it be stuff like the slight glow coming out of every light on this thing. So there's lots of little lights on this guy, like the blue light up here. There's a very slight blue right here where it's reflecting out. These little green searchlights here, little slight green right here and here. Right? Because again, I wanted everything to have a touch. Everything that I could possibly touch. Every little bit of weathering, every little bit of detail, 
the ground being cracked where he's stepping under his feet because this is a many, many, many ton war machine stepping on concrete that isn't ready to support it, right? So it cracked the concrete. I wanted every single element of this to be thought through in detail and nothing was just being phoned in, right? Uh, for example, the number of times I actually had to repaint this text across here was way too high. Uh, but that's because every time I just wasn't happy. It wasn't exactly how I wanted it. It didn't come out exactly right. So every little thing that I could do to constantly, constantly, constantly push this guy. And ultimately, that's what a competition miniature is. It's not about hitting this level of quality, what you see on the screen right now. It's about what it does to you. And that's why these are all subjective measures. If I had to summarize all of this, tabletop is putting speed above quality and focusing on fun and getting painted miniatures on the table at whatever level of skill you can achieve within the time box you set for yourself, focusing on the areas that people look at and that matter. Those faces, those bases, those weapons and shields, banners, stuff like that. That's tabletop. We all are gonna have a different tabletop and that's okay. It's a wide, wide spectrum. Above that, you have display quality, where you're now focusing on the quality, on the technique, on the outcome more than the time, where you're trying your best to push yourself, to push your contrast, to include those additional elements that make a piece interesting at 10 feet, at one foot, at one inch, right? And then competition is where you're taking that to the next level where you're getting obsessive and pushing yourself. Part of what I think it means to paint a competition miniature and why I encourage people to do it is because it means you have to be slightly uncomfortable. That's why it's good, not why it's bad. Painting a competition miniature is at times frustrating, heartbreaking, exhausting, right? And that's great. If it's the only thing you ever did, you might as well just smack your head against the desk now. It's just, you're, you're gonna stop painting. I paint a lot of competition figs every year. And by a lot, I mean probably six or seven. And that's a lot. Like if these things take an average of one to 200 hours in a year or per, which is probably about right, depending. That would mean I'm spending somewhere between 600 and 1,000 hours painting competition minis in a year. That's almost half my time painting on six miniatures. So I do this about a full-time job, which is about 2,000 hours a year. So that's a lot of time. I and, and I couldn't do that that much. You know, some years I might do four, some years I might do eight, but that's probably a good average. Whereas if you're doing a display of quality miniature, you can still get something that looks really nice, that employs all those high level techniques, that gives you something that's really kicking, but you're not spending that double the amount of time cleaning up those minute micro details that people aren't gonna notice. Adding in those itty bitty baby elements that you've gotta hold the miniature for 30 minutes before you actually notice, whoa, I can't believe they did this thing too. Super great. It's good to have minis that do that every so often, but you can't do that with every mini. And like I said, in the end, whether your mini is tabletop or display or competition, none of these things innately make one better than the other. They are all painted miniatures. Hence, they are all good, period. Now, obviously some might do better than others in a miniature painting competition, but even my competition level minis often don't win competitions because there will be other people there. I wasn't up to snuff for that particular time or whatever the case, and that's fine. That's why you can't define it by those external sources, but instead it's best to define these three levels by you 
by how they challenge you, how they push you, and how they help you grow and take your next step on your painting journey. So there you go. If you've got more questions about tabletop versus display versus competition, drop them down in the comments below. Uh, always happy to answer any questions there. Give this video a like if you liked it. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. But as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.